Well, Merry Christmas. Today we are finishing up our final week of our ugly Christmas sweater series. And so far we have wrestled with all of the ways that uh, we often live with ugly thoughts and ugly words and ugly motives. And today we want to take a look at the ugly actions that we choose. During all seasons, we have to be mindful of our actions, but the Christmas in particular is a season when we can make conscious decisions to bless people because of the blessing that God has given us by sending Jesus to earth. And we have the ability to live like Jesus, but often we end up acting like an ugly Christmas sweater. It is at Christmas time that we often see all at once the best of humanity and the worst of humanity. It's like that Charles Dickens quote, right? It was the best of times and it was the worst of times. We celebrate the birth of our Savior in a dimly lit room and with candles and we sing Silent Night and we're gonna do that a little bit later. And then suddenly the next day, many of us join with the rest of the country in, in pushing and fighting for the newest iPhone from Best Buy or arguing over all kinds of things and what I got and what you didn't get and, and like, or, or, or like going into the mall and trying to find a parking place or at your favorite restaurant, right? And the pushing and the shoving and the clamoring, it all happens, especially on the 26th at the after Christmas Day sales, right? How can these two extremes happen all at once? Well, the Bible says that we we have two natures constantly warring against one another. One nature inspires us to love the people around us and to to live humbly, while the other nature causes us to want to look out for ourselves first while pushing others down along the way. And, and, And this battle, it begins when we are very young, unfortunately, It doesn't get easier as we grow older. But by the grace of God and his spirit living inside of us, we can grow and treat others the way God would treat them. The Apostle Paul wrote a book to the Colossians. Really, it's a letter to the people living in Colossae. And the Colossians, they're a lot like you and me in that they were a group of people who were trying to figure it all out and what it looked like to to love people in light of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And somehow, some way, the sacrifice of Christ should have a profound impact on us as followers of Jesus. If not, we will never make the shift from being ugly Christmas sweaters to something way more beautiful. So it's time for our ugly actions to become godly actions. You see, the season of Advent is meant to be a time for us to slow down and to to reflect on Christ's birth and the reality of his return. We need to allow these two truths to, to change us from the inside out, to move us to become individuals who love one another well. The season reminds us of some very important things. But first, I want to talk about that that people do crazy things. In the name of Christmas. I want to share with you some of the crazy things that people do in the name of Christmas, and and most of these come from other countries where it just gets a little weird and out of hand. For example, Yule lads. Yule lads. Icelandic kids, they don't just get one Santa Claus, they get 13 mischievous trolls roaming the countryside the fortnight before Christmas. This is Elf on the Shelf on steroids. Like Snow White's Seven Dwarfs, each of the uh, um, Yulsvinar, Yul lads, um, have its own distinct personality. This is, this, this is their personality. Doorway sniffer. <laughs> spoon licker. Sausage swiper. Candle stealer. Curd cobbler. And the ominously named window peeper. And each of these takes turn visiting children who leave their shoes out in the bedroom window, dropping off prezzies for the good kids and depositing rotten potatoes for the bad ones. And then there's cagatillo, or the pooping log. This is a small stick with a happy face that lives on your dinner table in December. 
It's kept under a warm blanket, and it's fed every day with nuts and sweets. And then it gets beaten with sticks on Christmas Eve, and it poops out presents. In reality, the kids have to duck into another room to pray for the prezies while the relatives pop in and deposit the gifts under the blanket, like the log pooped them out. And then there's this. As if the threat of missing out on presents wasn't bad enough, Austrian kids who end up on Santa's naughty list have to worry about Krampus. It's a horned, hairy beast that snatches misbehaving children in his whisker, a wicker basket, serving as St. Nicholas's creepy enforcer. Many towns in Austria and neighboring countries, especially in alpine villages such as Salzburg and Treol, celebrate Krampusnacht, or on December the 5th, or Krampus night, when dozens of men dressed as the half-goat demon parade through the streets, bandishing sticks and terrorizing children. We'll just stick to our lump of coal, I think. In our own country, we have Christmas lights. And we've taken this Christmas light thing to a, a whole new level, competing with neighbors over whose is better and how many extra lights one can pile onto the roof of our house. And nothing, nothing really depicts this quite as well as this little video from our good friend, Clark Griswold. That's crazy, right? Um, if, you're, if you're addicted to those little videos on Instagram, like I know I am and many of you are, there are so many houses right now with full-blown light shows with music set to every conceivable rap song you can think of. I'm just thinking, what's it like to live next to that? Anyway, um, we do crazy things at Christmas. I remember one year when Joe was really little. A friend of ours deci decided to dress up and play Santa at our house, you know, in the red suit and everything. Only problem was that this was, Joe was, we, we only have Joe, okay? He's our only child. And this was like the first Christmas that, you know, he really understood what was happening and everything. And so we spoiled him. And I mean, we, it was ridiculous. We had so many presents under the tree for Joe that it got really awkward and kind of embarrassing as Santa would say, oh, oh look, another present for Joey. I, I mean, he was being great to Joe and stuff, but you could tell this, this it went way too far, right? But something about this year causes people to reorient, to reorient our lives around the holidays, right? Normal, rational human beings will cover their homes in lights and buy too many gifts and all kinds of other Christmas craziness. Schedules change, attitudes change, budgets change, or, well, really fly out the window, right? And why? Well, because it's Christmas, right? So people do some crazy things during Christmas. Paul is writing to the Colossians, and he's making a plea for the followers of God to reorient their lives in a similar kind of way, to be willing to live in this unique and countercultural lifestyle because of the love of God. And Paul is very persuasive in telling his audience that, that there can be no more excuses for not living God's way. He expects it. He says it in this way in um, Colossians chapter 3. This is going to be our scripture for this evening. So if you're able to, please stand for the reading of scripture. If you can't or don't want to, you can stay seated. It's fine. Um, we're in Colossians chapter 3, starting with verse 12. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tenderhearted mercy and kindness. Humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts, 
For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. Let the message about Christ and all attritionists fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord. Do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Word of the Lord. Praise be to God. You may be seated. So after this long discussion, which we're going to unpack in just a minute, Paul shares his final thoughts with his readers in verse 17. Whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. So everything that we do in our lives, whether in word or deed, needs to be done in the name of the Lord Jesus. How much of our life? All of it. All of our lives should be lived in the name of Jesus. So how are you doing with this? <laughs> if you were to look over this past month, how much of your life is lived based on the relationship that you have with Jesus? What percentage of your words or deeds are centered around Christ? More often than not, our actions don't look like Jesus, but are rather selfish and self-serving. Our actions are often born from ugly thoughts and ugly motives and maybe some ugly words thrown in there from time to time. But Paul tells us to make sure that our actions are reflective of the fact that we are grateful to God for the grace that we have received in our lives, that we give thanks for all that God has already given to us, and then we're more ready and able to be able to treat others with love and respect. All in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen? So the kind of intention it takes to wear a great outfit to a party is the same kind of intention that it takes to live as God's people. You don't just wake up each day with godly actions instead of ugly ones. It's a choice, right? Living the way that Paul tells us to live is like choosing a great Christmas sweater. No matter what kind of crazy sweater someone chooses to wear, they picked it. Paul writes to the Colossian and gives them this insight for the kinds of actions that their lives are to exemplify. He says, since God chose you to be the holy people that he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. Now, the Greek word here for clothe or to put on is enduo, okay? Enduo literally means to sink into a garment, or to cover yourself. This is an active word that, that Paul is using to paint a picture for his readers, right? In order for us to love people well and not act as ugly Christmas sweaters, we must intentionally put on new and better kinds of actions. The kind of intention that it takes to pick out a great outfit for the Christmas service or, or to go out to Christmas dinner in or the same, is the same kind of intention that it takes to live as God's people. You don't just w wake up each day with godly actions and avoid ugly actions. We have to make a decision each day how we're going to treat other people. We must decide how we're going to treat our spouses, how we are going to treat our children, how we're going to treat our friends. Paul lists out the kind of things and actions that the Spirit requires of us. First, he says you must clothe yourself with compassion. Compassion is the ability to see a situation from someone else's vantage point, right? To feel what somebody else is feeling. There's empathy involved. Compassion is what leads people to serve others and to give sacrificially. Compassion is, is the key to changing a broken world. And it takes a selfless attitude, and, and the results are in, in people listening to one another and caring for one another. But Paul also tells us that we must clothe ourselves with kindness. Kindness. Kindness sounds like a simple word, but it's much harder to live out, actually. Kindness is what happens when we're always looking for practical ways to serve one another. Maybe that's mowing somebody's yard that needs it. Buying groceries for a family who's under financial pressure. Or writing a letter just because you want to bless somebody else. 
Kindness is saying the right thing at just the right time or taking action when, when uh, you are in a position that you can make a difference. Kindness is doing the right thing to positively impact those around you. Paul tells us to close ourselves also with humility. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking about yourself less. Understand that? It's not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking about yourself a whole lot less. Humility is taking on the kind of mentality that Jesus taught and modeled for us. Selfishness is ugly, and it's the base of all sinful actions. Humility, then, is the way to overcome sin, and it's the way that Jesus made reality. Paul tells us to close ourselves also with gentleness. This comes from a word meaning controlled strength. I really like that. This word is not about weakness, but it's about power. The power that comes from the Spirit of God living inside of us and helps us to control our impulses in gentleness. Our actions are expressed or expresses themselves in service to the weak and, and the powerless among us. This is not a word that describes a wimp. It, is a, it describes someone who's not afraid to step into injustice or brokenness and instigate change. Paul tells us to clothe ourselves in gentleness, but he also tells us to clothe ourselves in patience. It's not one of my favorite words. <laughs> this word can be transferred, translated also as long-suffering. It means to put up with something for a long time before getting angry or giving up, right? Clothing yourselves in patience allows you to love people who are at times hard to love and to serve people who are hard to serve. Patience is a key to becoming someone who looks like Jesus because spiritual maturity, it doesn't just happen overnight. It takes intentionality. It takes time. It's something you choose. So you pick out your outfit. None of these attributes come to us naturally. We must choose them. We must choose to put them on, like clothing. We have to clothe ourselves in them. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves, it says, with tenderhearted mercy and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience, right? Making allowance for each other's faults, and, and to forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. Have you ever had an ugly Christmas sweater that you loved? Maybe you wear it every year to all the parties, right, all the gatherings, but then one day you snag a thread of it, and it starts to stick out a little bit. And, and you carefully try to snip it off or, 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 or to tie it up. And you find yourself as you're pulling at it that, you know, more of the sweater possibly can come unraveled until almost the whole thing can come unraveled, right? This is a, this is a dangerous moment. And it's a moment that you realize that everything in that sweater is connected. And if you tug on that, it will become unraveled. Every thread is part of another thread, right? The same is true for us as Christians. All of the things that Paul says in these verses have one common thread, and that thread is love. He says, above all else, put on and clothe yourselves in love. This is the action that gives life to every other one. Without love, all of the other attitudes unravel and mean nothing. The Christmas season is all about a God who loved us enough to send his own son to save us. Therefore, it makes sense that love would be the binding attribute for us to love others creates godly actions, right? Well, I want to close with this, that love is a verb. Love is a verb. In order to really love others, we have to put love into action. To move from ugly actions to godly ones, it starts with love. The word that Paul uses for love here in this passage in Colossians is a very specific word. It is the Greek word agape, which means sacrificial love, 
Agape is a love that will cost us something. And the question is, are you willing to pay the price? Are you willing to pay the cost to live with love? We cannot just say that we love people. We must show that we love people through our actions. If we're going to live with love this Christmas season, it must start with God's love in our hearts. We must first realize that God truly loves us. He loves you and he loves me. John 3, 16 and 17 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. God himself was motivated by love. This love prompted Jesus to come to earth in the first place. God did not send Jesus to come and condemn the world, but to rescue it. Every action Jesus takes throughout his life and ministry, and even his death and resurrection, it's all based upon love for all of humankind. We read this in 1 John chapter 4. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this, the love of God is manifested in us. That God has sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. We have this incredible opportunity to love people around us. And in loving others, we make God's evident to, to the world who cannot see him. You see, the mark of a Christian is someone who is dedicated to embracing God's amazing love for us and allowing this love to be overflowed to everyone else so that they can see it too. And by seeing it, they can, they can see God in action. Love is action. Therefore, this Christmas season, this week, I want to challenge each of you to choose one person or one family to offer sacrificial love to to put on compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience in a way that we treat them. Maybe it's a stranger. Maybe it's a neighbor. Maybe it's a brother or a sister. This season, this Christmas, we have this opportunity to love one another. Because Christmas isn't ugly. Christmas is beautiful. Christmas is a time when we come to a manger and a baby. And Mary and Joseph, some animals. We see shepherds and angels and wise men giving and receiving of gifts. And we stood there and we gaze on that nativity scene and we see love and we see beauty and we don't see ugly because Jesus demonstrated for us beautiful thoughts beautiful words beautiful motives and beautiful actions and when we get to know Jesus and love him because he loved us, we take part in that beauty. So go out there this week. Find somebody that you can bless in some way. And show them the love of Christ. Amen? We're going to invite the choir to get ready. And as they come up here to, to get into place, we're going to sing Silent Night. We're going to dim and turn off all the lights and stuff, or most of them. <laughs> and, uh, so that, and we're going to light candles. Each of you got a candle, right? 
And when the song is over, just quietly exit and enjoy this Christmas season. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this word that you've given to us tonight. For the ability that you've given to us to be able to come and to put on love and kindness and patience and gentleness. And Lord, we just thank you so much for this Christmas season. We pray, Lord, that all of the ugliness that can happen during this season could be turned into something beautiful, and only you can do that through your grace and through your mercy. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.